Hello, ladies and gentlemen. This is Professor Hamamoto. It is March 31st, year 2022, and it is 9 a.m. Pacific Standard Time. And I am pleased to welcome Mr. Pele Netrot Taylor. Am I pronouncing your name correctly, sir? That's right. Pele Taylor is best. Pele Taylor. All right. Real good. And he is currently in Sweden, and I've been watching his videos with rapt interest, especially his interviews with everyday citizens of Sweden who are undergoing this incredible assault, if you want to call it, of so-called multiculturalism. And before we get underway, I want you to, after the show, of course, go to the retailer that ate the world, otherwise known as Amazon, and purchase each one of these books in English. This is how I became uh, acquainted with Mr. Taylor's work. He's a working journalist, full time, and a documentary filmmaker, I should say. And I personally want to find out how I can get the DVD because it's not available on Amazon. It says not available in your country for some reason. Are you frozen there? No, I'm, you, I'm here. Oh, yeah. you okay? All right. <laughs> we got some latency here. But here we have a JFK a warrior for peace. And I wanted to ask Mr. Taylor why he's particularly focusing on the uh, JFK assassination as sort of a turning point in world history, not just American history. Then we have this incredible, well, they're all incredible. There's a, an interesting one. It's a uh, Sweden a dying to be multicultural. Excellent book. I want to get the DVD version. If it's available, you can tell us later how to obtain that. Uh, Sweden in the Crosshairs, which I got just recently. This is a, a more recent book, and I've taken extensive notes here. And uh, I will be dedicating a, a complete section, if not a chapter, on Mr. Taylor's work, his journalism, because it's a unique voice um, coming from that part of the world, Scandinavia, but Sweden in specific. And uh, another incredible book, which I got a couple of days ago, Brexit, European Union, American Empire. This one has a full color uh, cover with the man of the hour, Vladimir Putin. <laughs> right? We're going we're gonna to have to talk about Russia slash Ukraine slash NATO. Taking notes here, careful notes. And then see, he's very prolific. <laughs> and this is a more updated version of the previous one I told you. This is Again, full color cover Trump now, JFK, Nixon, and the deep state. It's under a politics and history, Pele Taylor, the author. I'm taking notes here. And during the course of this conversation, I hope we can try to understand through the lens of Mr. Pele Taylor uh, the connection between the uh, what I believe to be the murder, the assassination of the first uh, UN General Secretary, Dag Hammarskjöld, killed in the Congo in one of these airline accidents, right? And also for my own personal gratification and for those of fans of the, it's called in the US English, the girl who kicked over the hornet's nest and remade a couple of different times. There's the Swedish version, which is the good one. <laughs> and then there's the Hollywood remakes, which is not so good. But we're talking about Stieg Larsson and his incredible career. He was working on a book-length report on the assassination of Dag Hammarskjöld. This is written by a countryman of yours. His name's Jan Stocklasse. Do you happen to know him? No, I know of him. Oh, you know uh, of him? He's yeah. got a book in English language, a real thick one. Mm -hmm. uh, almost 500 pages, The Man Who Played With Fire which is about the critical biography of Stig Larsson. And from what I understand of my reading of Stig Larsson's the criticism and whatnot, um, he was a socialist. Uh, he comes from a communist background. I think he falls um, fairly square in that camp of um, social democracy that Sweden is well known for. And um, someone who was educated and steeped in leftist ideology at the university, Sweden was always seen as the the model, the exemplar of actually existing socialism. But Mr. Pele Taylor is 
giving us a quite different story <laughs> than what we might have been raised on. And uh, a lot of it has is down to what uh, is known now as multiculturalism, or as I characterize it years ago, weaponized multiculturalism. Yes, it was myself who put that word weaponization into the English language. <laughs> that was me talking about multiculturalism. So Mr. Pele, uh, Taylor, please tell us how you came to these conclusions. You grew up in uh, Malmo, from what I can understand of the documentary. Yeah. And uh, it's part of your socialization to accept on faith, the Swedish model of socialism. How is it that you got from your early socialization and of course you're educated in britain another country that's very much committed to so-called social democracy how is it that you departed so radically from that model of social and political economic organization well i'm i, I i'm more i mean my dad's english and my mother's swedish and um i regard myself as more english than swedish i mean i was born in england and then uh, when my parents divorced she took she's a very strong-willed woman she took us to sweden and then i went through the basic school in sweden and then i went back to england for my a levels and university and then the lot i spent 30 or more years something in england you know uh, having a career there as a journalist and then i came to sweden quite recently because my girlfriend lives here and uh, i sold a property in london and then sort of spending time here to write books and write about this terra incognita and sort of and, and come to terms with my old demons, because when I was living in Sweden in the 1980s, I was very much a rebel against social democracy. Uh, but then when I, real I realized that actually, and when I first came to England, I was carrying this animus against Sweden with me. And uh, it's taken me, it's been a long journey to realize that actually that Sweden I grew up in, or spent part of my childhood in, wasn't so bad. Um, and my whole life has been a sort of a journey in, in, in balancing these things and thinking about these issues. And I think that um, the multicultural issue, I mean, when I lived in Sweden in, in the intense years of the late Cold War, um, I, I, I was sort of, that was sort of buried. I mean, that was sort of fresh in my mind. Whereas people who lived through in Sweden through that period since, um, their idea of Sweden has kind of mutated or evolved. But my memory is early, early 1980s is crystal clear, very clear memories of Sweden being an exposed country surrounded by the Warsaw Pact at the end of the Cold War. And then Palmer sort of flirting with, with communism. We thought then that's what the media reported, but basically having to balance East and West and the fear of nuclear war and the refugees coming over from Poland in their balloons, you know, after the solidarity crackdown in 1981. All that was very crystal clear in my mind. And that sense of Cold War paranoia, you know, Sweden was like at the edge of the world. And I, I have a very strong, strong memories of that. And that I tried to put that Cold War fear and Cold War resolution, the Cold War ideas into my Palmer book and the submarine book, uh, which is the one that you best recently read. Um, and I remember um, thinking that when Palmer, I, I just started at Westminster, which is one of England's uh, top private schools. You know, it's a classic elite school where prep schools, you call them in the US, um, where people wear uniforms and it's all very formal and they make everyone becomes a prime minister or a banker or something like that. And it was far removed from my very egalitarian Swedish school, you know, which was much more like an American high school, like a sort of, you know, like the, the kind of high school you see in, in uh, I don't know, those uh, uh, Molly Ringwald films of the mid eighties. It was very much like that, you know, very much into dating and driving cars and so on. The John British Hughes. Much, sorry. The John, yeah, John Hughes, Hughes teen John, comedies. Exactly, exactly. that Chicago <laughs> environment he describes is exactly like the high school I went to. So, wow. so much, so much for socialist Sweden. You know, I realised that. <laughs> You know, it was a, it, the idea that, that peddled by some right wingers in the US that Sweden was a sort of socialist hellhole. That simply wasn't true, you know. But I, I was so devoted to this idea in my young teen, early, 
I was very, very, I wanted to get back to England. My father was living in England and my mother's living in Sweden and I wanted to grow up as it were. And I wanted to get to an English school where the academic standards were higher and, you know, flourish and get out in the world. And Sweden was cramped and so on. But so it took a long while for me to kind of realize that I wasn't leaving a socialist hellhole, but there's actually quite a, a decent society, you know. Um, and so Palmer, when he was defending himself against these assaults from the American media, the, the, I mean, the, you know, Sweden was held up to be a paradise by the Kennedy wing of the Democratic Party. And if you were, if you were a, a, a college professor in the 1980s, you drove a Saab or a Volvo to show that you were the kind of guy who liked Sweden and who wanted the USA to be like Sweden. On the other hand, if you're a Republican or a right winger, you thought Sweden had high suicide rates. It was a country where people had too much sex. Uh, or they were totalitarian. They could think free and so on. I have to say that I thought they were right, but I think they're totally wrong. I think Sweden is a much, much better country. Uh, and that none of that propaganda was actually true. It was much more like uh, a, a sort of country where everyone has lived the John Hughes, uh, you know, what's that film called? Breakfast Club Lifestyle, much more like that. And actually the English were much more impoverished and less free actually than the Swedes were. I mean, that's a huge shock. So everything that Palmer said about, you know, the, the, the social democrat welfare state actually providing the goods to allow everyone to allow their free expression was was true you know i mean it they make a good case for it um so even my book about multiculturalism which uh, i sort of wrote immediately when i came here i've kind of walked back from a little bit i mean i think that a lot of this um it's true that uh, i'm the only one who talks about immigration uh to my peer group here and people are afraid about it but it's also true that people in the uk and the us are now very uh, i can't speak for the us but in the UK, people don't want to talk about immigration so openly and uh, the transformations and this, these stupid discussions about gender and intelligence and things like that and transgender. I mean, the UK certainly kept caught up with Sweden or overtaken Sweden in terms of its um, intellectual oppressiveness. I don't know. Anyway, so mm -hmm. I, I, I don't know if I'm, if, if, I'm, um, if I'm, I'm making sense here, but I'm sort of saying that the uh, I, I my whole life has been a kind of journey, uh, a, a kind of re-examining that period of my life, my intense period of my teens, you know, when, when they just between 12 and 16, where I was desperate to get out of Sweden and imbibed. I used to go to the Swedish, uh, the town library in Malmo and read all the American news magazines publishing disobliging articles about Sweden, you know. <laughs> and the, the English Spectator magazine that had a correspondent here and the Times of London had a correspondent here who basically said, you know, this is a totalitarian state. This is what Europe will become if the Soviets take over. You know, um, the Swedes are adopting to the Soviets just as they did to the Nazis in World War II and so on. But I mean, I think anyway, I don't think I don't buy any of that anymore. I think it's, it was it was a much better country. But but my my but I think it's actually becoming a worse country. I think that, that what um, Sweden caught the kind of globalization bug in a big way in the 1990s, um, which said that, you know, you, you don't have a right to your own country, that people can move across borders totally freely and they have a right to do so. And that you don't have a, and if you say anything else, you're practically a Nazi, you know? So I don't think, so that's actually transforming Sweden. It really is. I mean, um, <sighs> It's, it's a very difficult to have a conversation about this because I'm, I'm cosmopolitan, you know, I have friends of all backgrounds and so on. I'm an intellectual and I've lived in a global city and so on. And, and I could say, well, you, you can believe in cosmopolitanism. You can believe that uh, blacks should not be treated badly. You should believe in, think that uh, Western empires and Western and, and uh, America and, the, U and uh, the UK have done terrible things in the Middle East. And you can agree with all those leftist things and still say, well, at the same time, I don't believe that immigration, free immigration in the world is, is a human right. I think, sadly, um, if we if we allowed that, you know, the West would be completely swamped and all the good achievement we've achieved uh, will be will disappear without the third world gaining that much. You know, I mean, uh, you could fill up Sweden with the suburbs of Lagos and it would be uh, completely ruined, whereas Lagos, the, the pressure on Lagos would hardly be noticed, you know. 
And it's very hard for people to, to accept that. I mean, the Swedes are quite numerate and they're intelligent. And I say, well, what, what are you going to do? The world's population is increasing by what, three million people a week or something. So two weeks world population increase, they could come to Sweden and it wouldn't make a damn bit of difference to global poverty, but it would completely destroy your welfare state, you know? So, and, and people just don't know how to handle those questions. So in a way, I sort of think, well, maybe, maybe my point in my youth about the Swedes being streamlined in their opinion, there's, there is some truth to that after all. I don't know. But then, I mean, oh. the Swedes are quite... Swedes are quite free thinking. I mean, they, they were quite good about the corona epidemic. You know, they were the only country that didn't have any restrictions at all. And I think they were right. And I think they were scientific about it. And they were rational. And that's Sweden at its best. They didn't care that the US pseudo left the New York Times and the Guardian, you know, harangued them for being, for killing their old people. No, I mean, they didn't. They, they came out to be one of the best countries in the whole pandemic. And no one here has ever worn a mask. I've never seen a mask. No, there'd been no lockdowns or anything. So that was Sweden at its best. But the, when you're talking about immigration, to me, that's Sweden at its worst, you know. Um, so um, I don't, uh, it's, uh, it, it, everything connects in a way. Uh, I'm saying uh, that the good, the good Sweden of my youth, in a way, the, the Sweden that I excoriate and criticize for being sort of monolithic and monoethnic and so on, that was actually a very good Sweden and provided freedoms for everyone and, and considerable equality. I mean, people said it provided the equality of the of the socialist bloc could only dream of and then liberty like America. So it really well, really was the best of both worlds. Now the Swedes really are throwing that away because they're importing a very, very different cultures. I mean, you know, mm -hmm. and maybe that in time they'll assimilate. But um, I think that they're, they're driven by a sort of fantasy based on watching too much Sesame Street or something like that, you know. Um, they're very, Swedes are still very, very pro-American and especially the business and intellectual elite. Mm -hmm. um, since, I, since I left in the early eighties, uh, by the, back then Swedes were very British in their orientation. They spoke British English and watched a lot of British television and so on. And when I got back a few years ago, all the young people speak with American accents and they all, the elite all read the New York Times and see, they watch CNN. And they think that if you import lots of immigrants, Sweden will become like New York City. I mean, that all, they have this fantasy about this. They, 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 they're afraid of their mono ethnicity. I mean, they've been told by their school system and by endless American propaganda that a mono ethnic society is borderline evil, you know, and um, you must open up your country because that's your duty. Uh, and not only that, it's not only a moral duty, it will actually work out well because the multi-ethnic society will provide better food, more exciting events, uh, more exciting innovation, interesting drama and clashes that will, I mean, basically, will, life will be like, I don't know, a Hollywood strip or something, or, or, or what's that, Venice Beach in California, people will be break dancing all the time and lots of hip stuff happening, or it'll be like, <laughs> you know, so, and, and, and they do that because, let's say, I mean, let's say Russia today uh, is practically, is banned in Sweden, and no one watched it even when it wasn't banned, uh, but the, the one, 0.1% who watched it maybe got some ideas about what Russia was trying to do, and they said, oh, that's Russian propaganda, my God, we're being swamped by Russian propaganda, my, we've got to ban it, okay, so that is Russian propaganda, but I mean, They've had 50 years of American films, three hours a night, you know, Hollywood films selling a certain version of the American dream. Isn't that propaganda? Why is only the Russians doing propaganda? Why are the Americans not doing propaganda? Of course it's propaganda. And so generations of people being brought up with this American idea, which, based, which, basically, or, which basically originates in a few Hollywood studios and in a few New York television executives' minds, that you've got to mix up everything, you know, and it will always produce good things. And I say, well, maybe, maybe it can in certain circumstances, but not everybody has to be like New York, you know, why can't sweet? That's what I say in my film. Great. It's great that we have these poles of culture where people rub shoulders and you have these incredible, interesting ideas and dynamism, but not the whole world doesn't have to look like that. And I think that if you're going to try and turn everything into New York, you know, you've got, you, you, you've got to, 
sequence your reforms because if what the Swedes are doing is that they're just in, importing people from Somalia and Afghanistan and then they're saying here they are now we will become New York you know so even in small towns these these local councillors these fantasists these small town mayors who are so bored with the power they've got in their little town they're importing Somalis and they're saying where's New York you know it's almost as if they're disappointed that, that this transformation hasn't happened it's 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 a it's a cult thinking you know and um, what's uh, the, the sequencing hasn't worked because uh, Sweden has maintained very high taxes. Uh, the Swedes are probably much uh, much less friendly than the Americans. Yeah, I mean, the Americans probably have this pioneering spirit. Everyone was an immigrant, so you had to talk to everyone because you couldn't rely on your established networks. You know, I mean, it's striking uh, when Europeans go to America. They say people talk to each other on the street and in the elevator, it's, but You'd be mad if you did that in Sweden, you know. If if an if a, if someone talks to you on the street in Sweden, they think he's drunk, you know. <laughs> <laughs> I mean, I don't know it. I'm really, I I write and I have my Anglo-Saxon contacts, so I don't worry about it. I just want to be left alone. Uh, but I I know very few people here. I mean, I don't go out of my way either, and I'm pretty introvert. But whereas if I lived in the states, I would probably know everyone by now because they would sort of seek contact with me, you know. So uh, so. Immigrants who come here find that the Swedes are not uh, probably welcoming. The tax system doesn't encourage new businesses. Um, the, the, the Sweden has a very low level of law enforcement. So, I mean, the US, maybe to put it bluntly, maybe works partly because you throw in jail all the criminal classes, you know. Whereas in Sweden, they flourish, you know. So uh, we know Syrians who say uh, Assad controlled all these Islamists, but they come to Sweden and they flourish because there are no laws against what, doing what they're doing and they're nothing, they're, they're completely free. And um, so there's been, a, there's been a rise in crime and a, there's been, the, the employment rate of the migrants is very low. Uh, but the welfare state is so generous that they're able to pursue their life projects and their life project might not be sort of becoming the next Google engineer or whatever. Um, but you know, producing large families. So, I mean, the, 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 the Swedish tax system is based on the idea that everyone is, is kind of heading towards becoming something that reflects their values for self-expression and their ambition to have a, a, an interesting career. And having babies is just like a part of that, you know. So, so you pay taxes throughout your life to, to Tide you tide your way over through the childbearing proportion of your life, so it's not actually a sort of gift welfare state. It's it's not gifted between classes and peoples. It's gifted between different parts of your life. So the, the working part of your life pays for the childbearing part of your life. I see. Um, so, but whereas the the um, uh, the um, but that and the thing is, people will find their way around a system. So the uh, you know you have you. Large immigrant families have a lot of babies on the welfare state, basically. I mean, I sound like an old style conservative. And so their, their birth rate is much higher than the native birth rate. And, you know, you have to ask, will they, will they produce the next generation of Google engineers? You know, will anybody be manning Sweden's next generation of nuclear power reactors? And I think I'm, I'm less dystopian than I was when I made the, the film. Uh, I mean, I don't think there will be a civil war and maybe Islamism won't even conquer Sweden. But I mean, it'll be just, it'll be a bit shittier basically than it, what it was. A bit poorer, a bit sort of crummier. There'll be lower levels of trust. You know, people won't leave their cars unlocked and their houses unlocked anymore. Um, when, you, when I opened a bank account in this country, you know, there were no questions asked. It just took me two minutes. And then when I tried to open a bank account in another bank locally uh, a few months ago, there was a whole slew of questions I had to answer. So the transaction costs and everything, which were very low in the Scandinavian countries are now higher. I mean, it's becoming much more bureaucratic um, and, and sort of more police. The policing is increasing, you know, uh, and the police are becoming tougher. So this idea of them being really nice people, which is probably true, they're now, they're, they are, Sweden is becoming a harder society and more like the rest of the world. And you have to ask, who benefits from this? I mean, yeah, sure, the migrants, but and the elites, the elites get cheaper labor or whatever, or they get their uh, international cuisine and they get, I mean, there's a lot of clientelism involved. You know, uh, if you 
get these um, welfare recipients, they get quite a lot of welfare, they'll go to the supermarkets and, you know, uh, so the, the immigration is partly a left-wing idealistic project, but it's also a, a capitalist project. The, the business class want immigration because they want customers, they want new and maybe cheap, cheap workers, although uh, the labor is partly determined by the trade. They want to smash the trade unions. You know, the trade unions were quite powerful here. So you can actually make a left wing case against immigration and saying that the, the right, as it were, wanted to import cheap labor and, and, and smash up the local cohesion. And, and when you don't have a common culture, um, what, you, what do you grasp for? You, you grasp for consumer products so that the new Swedish culture, the old Swedish culture was, I don't know, I mean, it's hard to transmit it to you if you're not Swedish. But I mean, certain folk songs, you know, Pippi Longstocking, all the things, strawberries in summer, um, dancing around the midsummer pole, meatballs, lingonberry, uh, Lucia, the Father Christmas. I mean, a whole, whole host of things. Lots of things that my girlfriends can tell you about, but because I'm not uh, entirely Swedish or only half Swedish, I only know about part, some of these things. But the new, gener the new Sweden shall be, you know, 10% Somali, 10% Syrian. 30% Swedish, where's, going to, where's the conversation going to take place? What, what's going to be the common culture? Well, it's going to be Nike shoes or something like that that's produced by America and manufactured in China. So it's going to be like everywhere else in the planet. That's the trouble. Mm -hmm. And, well, and uh, yeah, sorry. No, 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 you articulate this quite well. And it's incredible to be able to get these perceptions from someone who's in, in country, because as you noted, uh, those of us here in America, we're getting a distorted picture, both from the right and the left. Um, but let me pose this question to you, Mr. Taylor. Perhaps this uh, weaponized multiculturalism phase, these uh, weapons of mass immigration, maybe that's a transitional phase into something post-human, perhaps. I don't yeah, see I'm, that in your work yet, but I think we're heading uh, into the bioeconomy. The kinetic econ uh, economy is dead. Now right. it's the genetic economy. But in order to do that, there has to be a massive destabilization, denigration, debasement of the general human population. Take it from there, please. I can't. I mean, I, th I, I think you're, you're way ahead of me there because you're in an academic in California, which always peers into the future. And I know there's a, one of my friends who makes the films with me, he wrote a book about aging and transhumanism and things like that. And I can't, I feel very old fashioned because I'm, I'm just sticking to things that are, I don't speculate that much about the future, more than about sort of five or 10 years ahead. And all I can say is uh, quite possibly, yes, I mean, uh, technological change has a way of kind of completely upsetting all our predictions about the future and um, these shocks that we're experiencing um, could be sort of I mean we, let, let's say no, no one could have, or I couldn't have predicted the mobile phone 10 years ago uh, but it's completely transformed our everyday lives and the way we socialize and the way we we find our way around the world and using Google Maps and communicate using social media and, and God knows what and all these apps that we use. And that's, I don't know, I've got my first smartphone in 2014. Um, so that's eight years ago. So what will happen in the next year, eight years? I, I, so I'm just, I'm, I'm giving you a get, I'm, 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 I'm basically rambling on by saying I don't know much about it. Uh, but I can believe what you're saying, you know, I mean, but, and I think you're more cutting edge. I think that um, the stuff that I can give you from Europe is probably about the, uh, the the decline of a civilization rather than uh, any I don't I mean partly I'm, I'm, I'm like a, a sort of I'm sitting here taking in the ideas that are kind of floating around in, in, in intellectual circles in this country and so far I haven't seen anything on transhumanism so although I mean the Swedes have a re reputation for being quite innovative and They've got quite a lot of companies working in bioengineering or so on. I, I haven't heard any of it, except my friend then talked about, because he, he lived in the US or lives in the US part time, he talks about how we have to stop about this cult of death, because um, which comes from, comes to us from philosophers from way back, you know, all the Stoics and so on, because we couldn't do anything about death. They tried to, to make us accept it. But now that we, we might be on the verge of conquering death or we're getting into a new cyborg area, 
we have to get across our philosophical objections to, to living longer. So he found out that something like half of his 19 year old students, they didn't want to live longer, even if they could live longer. And that's amazing, he thought. I mean, what's what's the point of not living longer, you know? Mm-hmm. So is that a, a little a little bit in the area that you uh, you wanted to ask about? Well, you know, I'm not disagreeing with you, um, but my argument that is Sweden is at the cutting edge of the the new era of uh, AI, transhumanism, post-humanism. And uh, I'll, maybe your girlfriend who has been socialized in Sweden, whereas you did most of your growing up in uh, Britain, maybe she's familiar with the name Carl Martin Sandberg. And his professional name is Max Martin. Okay, I'll check it out. I'll, I'll find out, yeah. Well, the reason I mention him, he is a Swedish national, Swedish citizen, but he has had the the distinction of being the award winner of 11 best ASCAP. This is the American Songwriters Union uh, Songwriter of the Year. And he's producing something like 75% of all pop hits in America. Wow. This is Max Martin. And it's being done through this algorithmic revolution that is sneaking in behind the more obvious so-called a multiculturalist assault so right. i think this is a diversionary tactic and it's coming yes from hollywood from because uh, in early days from, during world war ii the uh the pentagon and now nato understood the propagand- propagandistic uh effectiveness of hollywood and later on the television and radio networks and certainly that holds true for for popular music Right. But I think it's coming from this is why I reached out to you. This is coming from the Scandinavian countries. It's coming from one of your neighbors, Denmark. Are you familiar with the Lego? Yes, yes. Lego is the new model for the new post-human economy. Okay. They even have amusement park called Lego Land. Right. Disneyland is old old hat. It's just filled and run by a bunch of pedophiles. Correct. Okay. Yeah. So it's the Lego land. So I'm, you are, your instincts are impeccable. You are at the heart of the revolution. And I really look forward to your future well, writing. So yeah, can you yeah, speculate? To, Feel you, free to speculate. Well, I, all I can say is that um, I think that um, the, the Scandinavians are a bit of a, of a sort of sand pit or a sandbox for experimentation. I mean, they're a North European people. They're pretty similar in values to the North Americans. And I think when, um, I don't know, when Apple or something pioneered their products, they'd always use Scandinavia as a test ground uh, because the Swedes are kind of famously willing to try new things, you know, um, and they can be a bit shallow in that respect, you know, I mean, uh, naive, naively sort of enthusiastic and, and especially if you go to Stockholm, for instance, um, it, there's a kind of very self-conscious hipster atmosphere with people walking around with their headphones and and kind of, jumping onto new trends that come from uh, from the US. I mean, the, the Swedes are, are sort of separated from Europe. I mean, they don't, it's, um, it doesn't have the old ballast of classical culture that goes back to the Romans or Greeks. I mean, they were never occupied by the Roman empire and they were heathen until quite late. So in some respects, the Swedes see themselves, they identif- even though it's a very old nation state, they identify a lot with the Americans and they don't, they didn't feel the need to, to pay obeisance to to their own classical culture, and they, they're, they're intelligent, but they're not. They don't have a a classical canon which they read and which might re- retard development. I mean, so they're more forward looking than the Brits. So, if you're looking at new, any new trends, I guess um, Scandinavians might be a good uh, a testing ground for it. Uh, the extent to which they might be aware of this, I don't know. I mean, they could be tested on without knowing it. I mean, they might, they could be sort of um, uh, guinea pigs, I mean, or led by sort of breadcrumbs from one trend to the next. So uh, multiculturalism is presented as a problem. And then somebody comes along with another solution. But uh, I'm not, I'm not, a, you know, I, I mean, I, um, I've actually worked as a, a technology writer for a British um, technology magazine. But I always stuck to politics and stuff. I don't know, I was old, old and I didn't jump in these uh, sci-fi issues but maybe I should uh, you know um, but 
Sure. I mean, um, we, we I, I, I'm very much a believer in the idea that we're kind of all guinea pigs of powerful forces, you know, and that propaganda is one of my favorite topics. I mean, NATO <clears throat> came out with a paper last month that said that the brain is the battlefield of the 21st century. Well, I hope that as a journalist, I think uh, Max Martin has a studio in Stockholm. If you're there, it'd be an incredible <laughs> article coming from to well, your perspective. Yeah, sure. oh, yeah. This is radically different. And uh, I think it's it's uh, good, bad or, or ugly. I, I, I'm not saying I, I don't think it's a healthy uh, trend when you have uh, music, popular music or movies monopolized by a very small group of people for what I believe are nefarious post-human ends. But uh, again, I'll be stated if I was an entrepreneur, I would buy uh, uh, an old abandoned uh, shipyard in Malmo and make uh, cinema 3D immersive entertainment complex uh, studios right there. So there's yeah. a business opportunity for you if you know any capitalists back in the city of London. Okay. <laughs> so, so, but I mean, this Max Martin guy, has he been written about? I, oh, uh, extensively. But you see, he's writing for these supposed multicultural Black artists and Latinos right, Puerto Ricans, Black, right. and so on. But it is a Swede who's doing all this funky music. Right. Not ABBA, not, right. you know, we're, yeah. when we think about Swedish music in America, people default to ABBA. No, it is Max Martin. Right. He's the true cultural radical. And by the way, the Swedish government recognizes that. And he himself in the press says, I owe everything to the public school system of Sweden. That's where I got my musical training. This is Max Martin, or uh, Sandberg is his, his uh, given name, his birth name. Well, I think, I mean, there's an enormous pressure to uh, accept. I, I, I mean, Swedes are, are, are told to be post-national, basically, um, except when it comes to standing up for Ukraine. So they're not allowed to stand up for Swedish national rights, but they have to stand up for new Ukrainian national rights. You know. <laughs> Well, can we pivot to that discussion? We have to. We let's well, talk about Putinism, and uh, I really want to get into NATO because, as as uh, hegemonic as the Hollywood uh, wet dream machine yeah. is, I think we're really looking at the hidden hand uh, based in Brussels. Yeah, I, I think. Well, what can I say? I mean, I I, I think um, uh, the. Uh, U.S. very much wants Sweden and uh, Norway, uh, Sweden and Finland to join NATO. Um, I think the the, um, the opinion is balanced 50-50 in this country. And my feeling is that they probably won't uh, in the short term. There's a kind of, I think that it's one of those issues which requires a 70% majority and rather than a 40-40 divide and 20% undecideds. Um, but I think the, I mean, the, the assassination of Palmer was basically a coup in a way. It was a coup against the neutral. I mean, what Palmer did was he was right next door to the Soviets. And he, yes, I mean, he did not attack the Soviets with the same enthusiasm as the, he attacked America. And so he, he but he, he was sort of, it was a pragmatic. I mean, he wasn't, he was a Democrat and so on. And he, but he thought that you had to have dialogue with the Soviet Union, and um, you couldn't kind of. And but he, what he did was he he pressed the Swedish desire for activism, which is very different from the Swiss and Austrian acceptance of neutrality. I mean, the Swiss are neutral; they are ideologically and uh, politically and constitutionally neutral. Sweden is merely non-aligned, which means that they arrogate themselves the right to join whoever they want in this in case of war and they don't feel that they have to keep quiet on political issues of the day unlike the swiss who says we, we're neutral that means we don't comment on on ideological things and but the swiss the swedes always thought of themselves as a kind of a third third power in the world you know you had the blue side and the red side and then you had the white side the swedes and the, so there is this kind of missionary impulse in sweden and, and during the cold war palmer made sure that that was entirely directed towards the third world and then you kept a bit quiet about russia and all that you know um 
And so the Swedes were very active in the uh, support of the ANC. I think they were the largest supporters of the ANC after the Soviets. And although officially they only spent money on humanitarian aid, you can't divide the two. So effectively they were sponsoring, uh, I mean, the, the MK movement, which was ANC's terrorist wing, basically benefited from Swedish money. And I don't think it's been covered enough in the Swedish uh, press, Swedish his history. I mean, after apartheid ended, Swedes forgot all about it. Everyone forgot about South Africa. But I mean, I think there's a lot of bitterness in South Africa among the old circles against Sweden. And uh, I think that the South Africans were in on the Palmer assassination, but I don't think they were necessary. I think there were two death squads and one of them was South African, but I don't think they pulled the trigger. I think they were decoys. Um, but um, so Palmer and, and, and they, they were very much um, about bringing the non-aligned movement under a kind of Swedish umbrella. So while Reagan and uh, you know Chenenko were duking it out in the early eighties, um, Palmer made sure, a bit like Hammerfeld in a way, to kind of make friends and and selling using Sweden's good name to sort of elevate the non-aligned movement into global force as a sort of sole sweet European power to do so. And, and Sweden was rich and democratic and it, it boosted Sweden's self-belief enormously that here, you know, the Swedish prime minister went to talk to India, went to Brazil, he went to Mexico and he talked to these countries as equals, even though his country was a fraction of the size of these countries. And I mean, he was a, he's a real gadfly to the, to the Americans, I think. Um, and, but anyway, when, when he was killed, um, I think there were elements of the Swedish intelligence services involved. I mean, they were the only ones who hated him enough, really. And I think maybe the CIA. But I don't want to, I, I, this, there's been so much speculation about that murder. And I, I, I spent years going down the rabbit hole. And uh, I see new generations going down the rabbit hole. And I don't think it's, it's worth it unless we get more clarification from the US or something. The, the, the JFK assassination is much clearer. I mean, the evidence for who didn't carry out this assassination is a much clearer picture. Maybe because if you think about it, Kennedy was assassinated in an open plaza in front of hundreds of people. Uh, whereas Palmer was killed in a dark street in a small country at, at 11.15 on an icy night, it was minus seven degrees Celsius, you know, and, and it was all dark and the killer disappeared, much like that. So it was, it's, if you can't solve the Kennedy assassination conclusively, which they haven't, you're unlikely ever to solve the Palmer assassination. So. Let's start, and, and Sweden has far fewer investigative journalists than the US has. So the Kennedy assassination is a much better place to start. But my, the my thesis is, so what I did was, when I wrote my panel book, which you've read, was I stopped searching for the killer, because uh, I thought this is a hopeless quest. And I turned it into sort of geopolitical story of Palmer and Palmer's biography as a man who grew up in a kind of right-wing anti-Russian family. I mean, anti-Russian, Anti-Russianism is the kind of lifeblood of the old Swedish aristocracy, you know, that's what their core belief. And he, he grew, grew away from that and he became a socialist and he repudiated his aristocratic background and he focused on the newly developing countries. I mean, he, he was a, a disciple, a creature of the Hammerfeld era. Hammerfeld died in 61 and Hammerfeld, uh, Palmer was already in government then. So when he, he, he became famous for his talks, uh, his criticism of Vietnam, you know, comparing to the Holocaust and so on. Kissinger and Nixon hated him. And the Swedes, certain Swedes loved him for that, you know, and he became, he put Sweden on a map, you know, Teddy Kennedy, uh, the, the sort of new frontier liberals. Because um, I think Kennedy, Palmer saw himself as a kind of the younger Kennedy, Kennedy brother. The, he really admired the Kennedys and he really admired that America, the liberal, the old liberal America he really admired. And I think he, he kind of, he put on some Kennedy-esque airs, you know, playing with the young children on the sandy beach and so on. Mm -hmm. And that kind of, he was very clever as well, a very good speaker like Kennedy and so on. I think he was less, uh, anyway, but he, he was killed. So that led to a total shift in Sweden's foreign and security policy uh, towards uh, NATO and the West. And instead of the playground being far away Africa, and you know Congo or whatever you like, it became uh, the Baltic states and now Ukraine and Be Belarus. And I think uh, everything that's being done in these countries uh, since the you know the, all the regime change efforts, you know whether it's in Belarus sponsoring demonstrators or or um, uh, 
sponsoring the coup in, in, in uh, Ukraine. Sweden has a hand in that. And I don't think, I think, I think Sweden's act as a conduit. I think there's a kind of secret alliance between the intelligence services of Sweden, the UK, Estonia, and maybe Ukraine. There's a kind of axis there, an arc, an allegiance arc. Interesting. The, the British are basically trying to cause trouble in the European Union and cause trouble against Russia. And what they're doing is that they, they're, they're geeing up the Poles and so on to create conflict with Russia and thereby making the rapprochement between Russia and Germany, which is a historic thing. The British have always tried to sow discontent in Europe by creating, it's like, you know, creating alliances and so on to, to hamper and, and limit their potential rivals. And if the Poles hadn't been there, you know, there might have been this kind of friendship between Russia and, um, and Germany and China and Germany, you know, and you'd have this kind of Eurasian alliance or Eurasian friendship zone where, which would, which would push out the United States and push out Britain. And so what, what's happened, of course, is the, 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 the British sponsor the Poles and, and kind of push them against Ukraine, which is their old imperial heartland. And the Poles don't need much pushing, you know. I mean, they, they, they're not satisfied with their sort of um, being as prosperous as they've ever been in history. You know, they have, they're a country with a kind of imperial fantasy, basically. And I think they want to, Belarus and Ukraine are their old imperial lands. And it was also part of the old Swedish imperial lands. I mean, Sweden, before it became a neutral country after 1815, was a very, very aggressive in, invader of Eastern Europe. Um, and there were two times when they reached far into the Russian heartland with a country that was much smaller, but much better trained. And all of Peter the Great's reforms to make his country more European uh, in 1718 were a response to the fact that the Swedes with a much smaller army and using Ukrainian auxiliaries uh, had defeated the Russians so powerfully. So Peter the Great, you know, he went to to, to, to Holland to learn shipbuilding. He insisted that all Russian men have to shave their beards and all that stuff. And then he, he actually reformed the Russian administration on Swedish lines, you know. Mm. Sweden had a very powerful state, but Sweden was a very efficient warfare state, highly organized, highly bureaucratic, and allowed a very small army in a very small country to basically conquer large swathes of Eastern Europe. And that that memory, that folk memory, Sweden's never been occupied or invaded. It's an occupied and invaded other countries. That folk memory kind of sits there. So almost the only acceptable racism in Swedish discourse is to hate on Russians or hate on East Europeans being inferior beings. So you, you can have literally people saying in the same sentence, you know, I love Arabs and so on, or I love Muslims. And you say, well, maybe shouldn't, there shouldn't be so many Muslims in this country. They say, oh, you can't say that. And then they'll say something incre incredibly rude about the Russians, you know, or, <laughs> Um, so, it, it's, so, so basically, since Palmer died, Swedish policy, NATO kind of exploited this, this, this hate gene in the Swedish psyche against uh, everything Russian. And I think that the Swedes, uh, although they're officially neutral, are very, very active in their, whatever's going on in Eastern Europe now on the NATO side. And I think that uh, their listening posts, their intelligence services, their, their equivalent of the NSA, and their satellite launch bases, all doing things that the Swedish public have no idea what's going on. And um, uh, are yeah. you going to be writing in that vein, talking about the the uh, global reach of the uh, Swedish surveillance state? Really? Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I I, I haven't got the sources at the moment for it. Oh, okay. Uh, but I wrote that that uh, the, I wrote about what happened in the nineteen eighties. I mean, what happened in the eighties was that. Um, the, my submarine book talked about how the um, U UK and US um, faked these, pretended to be Russian submarines, and they were kind of doing these covert operations in the Swedish archipelago. So this is in years, Sweden in the crosshairs, ladies and gentlemen, right. of the book, yes. That's right. So it was basically a covert operation to, to, to make it seem as if the Russians were about to invade a democratic European country, and it negatively impacted on the Soviet Union's reputation enormously in Northern Europe. And it also impacted negatively on Palmer's reputation. So you could say that the death of Palmer was a culmination of the immensely negative press he was saying, because he was saying, come on, these, guys, these, these are not Soviet submarines. 
OESR, the Swedish press, were totally on the side of NATO, said, we should join NATO because we're about to be invaded. And then the military said, yeah, we can guarantee you that they're Soviet submarines. And so there was always this back and forth. There are a few independent journalists saying, well, where's your evidence for this? Where are your photos? Where are your radar readings? And they didn't have any. It was, I mean, it was purely propaganda. And I think in the 1990s and 2000s, there was a lot of relatively open debate in Sweden and books were written basically showing that all the military evidence was not, didn't exist. And in as much as I did have evidence, like you, you analyzed that these classified pictures of, of um, keel tracks and sizes of the submarines, and there were even a few radar pictures of submarines, they all fit perfectly with um, Western British submarines but um, not with uh, Soviet submarines, you know. So I would say, you know, let's say 2005 to 2010, it's a kind of generally accepted truth that yes, the Swedes were victims of a kind of covert intelligence operation uh, mm -hmm. to make the Soviets seem worse than they were and to push Sweden towards NATO. But in the last 10 years, I mean, every new generation forgets what the last generation has learned. I'd say that that has been forgotten, you know. So Swedes are back into their old hate Russia mode and. Uh, so that was the topic of my book, you know, and I was excellent. Just... And one of the takeaway points I got, and certainly I'm going to explore this myself, is your insight that the action is in the Baltic, really. When you talk about Soviet, uh, now Russia, but Soviet Union up in the North Sea area, not yeah. written about until until I came across this book of yours. Yeah, I mean, I think um, the um, in the Cold War, the 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 conflict lines in Central Europe were static and not much could be done there. But um, Northern Europe was relatively uh, peaceful. I mean, the, the Scandinavians, the Russians had a kind of gentleman's agreement not to arm the Baltic too much um, and against this. So I think that there were no foreign troops stationed in Norway, which was a NATO member, and the Baltic didn't have too, too many ships of either side and the, the, the Russians didn't have very much. The Russians had all their forces focused uh, in Murmansk. That was their nuclear submarine base. That was their second strike capacity. I mean, so that was their insurance against being nuked by the US, which was their big submarines in Murmansk. And if there was a run up to war, they'd send those submarines onto the Arctic ice and where they couldn't be detected because the, even the, the West had very good uh, submarine detection. They, they could track almost every, Western, every Russian submarine through its entire cycle but not if they went under the Arctic ice. So they were gonna park under the Arctic ice and then be there so that if America uh, launched a nuclear attack on the USSR, they would not launch a nuclear attack on the US, which would prevent the US from doing that, right? So what the Americans then did was that they sent their own submarines right into Murmansk and kind of messed around there. And I mean, there's probably things that we don't know about yet, but I mean, I know that they had a, a, a program called Ivy Bells, which, which was a listening program. But I think they also sent special forces in and played around like that. But the, 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 more importantly, the, the, the Northern Europe um, was a potential soft underbelly for the Soviets. And at the same time as the, the Reagan was... Um, Reagan had a very young and aggressive and gung-ho naval secretary called John Lehman, um, who had extracted a promise from Reagan to build a 600 ship Navy. And that Navy, if it was gonna play a part in the Cold War, was gonna kind of play around um, in the Nor Norwegian Sea off the coast of Scandinavia. And they were going to use their carrier-based planes to kind of penetrate the soft underbelly it wasn't a soft underbelly because it was a northern thing. But if you see what I mean, mm -hmm. the Russians had all their troops in Germany, but the, they could, the, the Americans could penetrate through the Baltic states and hit Leningrad much more easily. And what I think the secret plan was, was to um, bring Sweden on board very early in, in uh, a hot war, either probably by simulated attack um, because the Russians had no interest in bringing the Swedes on because Sw a neutral Sweden protected their weak flank. It, a neutral Sweden protected their entire northern flank. But if Sweden was brought into the war and became a NATO base, Russia was screwed, right? Mm -hmm. So I think what, what, the whole thing when, when it has, it still hasn't, hasn't been was a fake attack, maybe even an assassination of Palmer 
by Western special forces or something like that, or a kidnapping or something, or a landing. And they were, they were going to be, it was a false flag, they were going to be Russian invasion. And then NATO could carry out a friendly occupation. And what's, uh, of, of, and they could rebase their, their reinforcements. Because what, what, if West Germany was invaded by the Soviet tank armies, um, a lot of the American air bases would be knocked out very quickly. So what the Americans, I think, were planning to do was to use Sweden as an unsinkable aircraft carrier uh, and rebase a lot of their reinforcements in and there and use that to attack the Soviet Union. And um, uh, using that and the carrier play, carriers and just and it's all I mean, it's it's, it's a lot. A lot of it's bluff, I guess, as well. A lot, a lot of it's you it's a, or a chess game. You don't know what the other guy's going to do, but the very threat of that. May, it was aimed at making the Soviets think again. Mm -hmm. So there was all that tension in the 1980s. But now, of course, I mean, it's it's not it's an open secret. I mean, Gotland, the island of Gotland is basically a NATO base. NATO has kind of pushed and surrounded the Soviet Union to a much greater extent than uh, it ever was in the Cold War. Um, but anyway, I, you're right. I mean, one ought to write about this. And almost no one in Sweden is doing it, perhaps because they end up we get, get into trouble, you know. I'm, uh, you know, they, they don't mess around these people. Um, but I, I, I read quite a lot of the Swedish alternative media and they talk quite openly about immigration and so on. But they don't talk about the, the Swedish deep state at all. I mean, interesting, and just as, the UK doesn't talk about its deep state at all. Americans are much more open about uh, talking about the CIA and so on. But you don't have that kind of media in, the, in Sweden or the UK. Uh, they're more secretive. My gosh, I'm looking for your future writings. I see some a, a new thread, more than a thread, a rope being uh, emerging now about uh, writing about the Swedish deep state. You'll have a big audience in America because, as we've mentioned or you've mentioned already, we have a, a very limited understanding. We have a, really caricatures from the left and right in America about what Sweden represents. So you would be doing a service to not just uh, your fellow Swedes, but to America in and, and for the cause of peace, world peace in general. Yeah. So I encourage you in that area. Well, thanks. I mean, yeah, sure. I, 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 that's uh, and we're, we're making this um, film about uh, Dog Hammarskjöld. I mean, dig where you stand, as it were. And Dog Hammarskjöld, I'll send you the, the, the links to the trailer. Please. We've got a website and you can put it up or maybe you can integrate it into this interview. I mean, it's a very, we have very good production values. Um, Hammarskjöld was, uh, he was basically an ally of Kennedy. I think uh, Kennedy uh, was a good man and he wanted, to, I mean, there was that James Douglas book who talked about Kennedy as a man of peace um, and he would have ended Vietnam in his second term. He wanted to have a joint space program with the Russians, and he, the Berlin crisis of 1961, um, was a pre forerunner of the Cuba crisis and far less well known. But I mean, basically, the Russians, that Khrushchev was going to nuke. The, he talked about nuking the West unless the West evacuated West Berlin, and the West said, "We can't do that," you know. Um, and the Russians said, "Well, we want our socialist." state east germany which is our pride and joy which we 20 million russians died in world war ii to create that state and they can't be complete unless we have west berlin as well and you don't belong there anyway and you've got the whole of the rest of the world and uh, kennedy and the, and the and the west refused i mean they're probably good they good reason i i don't have all the candle for totalitarian socialism but um it was it was almost like an unstoppable force me meeting an unmovable object and in the summer of 61 there was so much talk about um nuclear war and um i think that um the uh kennedy was using uh dog hammerfeld as a kind of back channel to bring on uh, i think that had hammerfeld lived um there would have been discussions about turning uh, Berlin, West Berlin, into a United Nations city, a kind mm -hmm. of Vatican city of peace. And there were hints at it. I mean, American uh, peace uh, movement, um, or peace intellectuals and people on the left wing of the Kennedy administration had, uh, had talked for quite a long time about various moves to disarm and, de and weaken 
the armaments race in Central Europe. Uh, one was to turn uh, Berlin into UN headquarters. Uh, the other was to uh, turn the border into a UN policing operation. The third thing was to, to have a, um, inspection rights over the entire Central Europe for both sides, but East and West. The fourth thing was to demilitarize and neutralize and denuclearize this whole region. All these suggestions were kind of floating into one another. Um, and the British, surprisingly, uh, were very, very keen on this because they were led by Harold Macmillan, who'd fought in the trenches of World War I and hated war, and he hated the Germans. And I think what, um, what, and actually they could find common cause with the Soviets because the Soviets, the Americans and the British might be at loggerheads in the Cold War, but they all had this very common experience, which was Nazism, which was only 15 years before. So the entire political generation had experience of fighting the Germans. And so they could almost make a common cause about that, you know, that the uh, German, I mean, Khrushchev's fear, big, big fear of the, of the Russians was not so much America, but, but a resurgent Germany. I mean, they thought that Germany was going to turn into Fourth Reich or something and, and reinvade. The, I mean, it sounds ridiculous now when we know what Germany turned into. But I mean, I guess that if it happened only 15 years before, the idea that uh, the Germans were going to rearm and, and uh, you know, I mean, um, the Adenauer government of 61 to 63 or whatever actually had a lot of people, I guess, who were former Nazis and a lot of German, West German industrialists were Nazis and so on. And part of it was propaganda, but part, there was some truth to it as well. But there was a genuine fear. And I think what all these uh, Western peace moves founded on, uh, they're coming from the Kennedy administration, um, and with some response from the Russians, actually, um, and, and with Hammerfeld talking about being the, the sort of front man for the Kennedy administration, because he was a Swede and so on, uh, it founded on, on, on German opposition, because the Germans did not want to be a neutral zone. There was quite a strong movement in Germany uh, to, to sort of, not to return to Nazism in any way, but to be a great power again. And... Um, uh, acquire their own nuclear weapons and there were there was talk of acquiring nuclear weapons uh, and, and kicking out nato basically and uh sidelining the americans and then facing the russians on their own or and and and, and rather than being kind of a new neutered neutered state that they actually became i mean um and they were in talks with the with the french with de gaulle about acquiring his nuclear weapons and so on so uh, one, one of the new angles to the Hammerfeld crash is the possibility there were actually some Germans involved in, in the assassination as well. Wow. So that's completely new. I mean, I, I, don't, I don't mind. I, I do it for breakfast, lunch, <laughs> and dinner, pointing out the Americans and the British is doing these kinds of things, or the Russians. I mean, the Russians are not innocent in any way, but the Germans are kind of completely under the radar. But that's what my research is kind of leading me into. But, Incredible. Uh, yes. Yeah, I know. Um, and the friend, because Hammerfeld was, um, he wanted, uh, he believed in the non-aligned movement. He believed that all these small countries in Africa and so on should be completely independent, um, sort of social democracies, if you like. And he didn't, I, I don't think he understood ethnic nationalism and so on, or he, he didn't want to understand it. Uh, so he didn't think that Congo should split up into its ethnic components, but just be a sort of unitary state. I don't know if that logic is correct, because I mean, on the other hand, if you if you allowed every ethnicity in Africa to become its own nation state, then there would be chaos. I don't know. But anyway, he was at loggerheads also with the French, because um, the French idea of decolonization was to to recreate these nominally independent countries as kind of vassals of France. And that's the case still to this day. They call it France Afrique, you know, countries like uh, Cote d'Ivoire and, and Morocco and and uh, Gabon, uh, Libreville, uh, Congo, Libreville, and Cameroon, and so on. They still have a very strong in French influence. So de Gaulle wanted to, de Gaulle was obsessed with French greatness, and he wanted to use and team up with the Germans and use the African colonies to create this kind of giant third force in opposition to the Americans and Soviets. And Hammerfeld's plan for a kind of, Hammerfeld Kennedy's plan uh, to to defuse this terrible Berlin crisis by by neutralizing Berlin uh, 
which would have been a success with Khrushchev, founded on this total opposition from the from the uh, uh, America, from the French and and the Germans. And it's interesting because this Ukrainian crisis, we, we sort of think, I, I guess it's a kind of legacy of the Iraq War or something that the Ameri the British and America is always the hard uh, hard on, full on for war and conflict, and the Germans and the French are the kind of the peacemakers. And you see that now in the Ukraine where the uh, Germans absolutely don't want to escalate and the French, are, Macron is talking to Putin every day or every week. Uh, but that my research has actually led me to think that uh, in the 1960s at least, uh, the British government and uh, the American government were actually quite willing to go quite far to appease uh, Khrushchev and um, uh, using Hammerfeld in the Anyway, so... Um, well, you know, you're, if you were going to pursue the um, Hammerschuld connection, I apologize for mispronouncing his name. Your timing is perfect because I'm seeing, in, at least in English language scholarship, there's a resurgence of interest in his career and how it fits in with the geopolitical tensions of the time. And you've already written about JFK extensively. Yeah. And if you tie those two together, I think you'll come up with a third synthesis, which is going to really help us understand what's going on today in 2022 and the brink of another threatened nuclear war, perhaps. Well, uh, yes, sure. I mean, it was uh, it was the tensest period before now, I'd say it was 61, 62. The Cuba crisis, yeah, but Berlin is much less well known and it lasted longer. Um, well, the Cuba crisis was a culmination of this uh, nuclear crisis that Khrushchev had initiated and in, actually in 58 but it really come out into the open in, in 60, 61. So a lot of the Hammerfeld scholarship is focused um, merely on Congo and the tribal conflicts there, but that's just a side story, I think. I think that the main concern in the world in 61 was, was Berlin and the threat of nuclear war. And uh, Kennedy was, and, and was trying every measure in the book to try and stop this from happening, and, and the UN had much more prestige then, and Hammerfeld was had huge prestige. I mean, he was treated as the ruler of a great empire, even though he was had nothing but the bureaucracy of the UN behind him. I mean, it's amazing uh, how, in a short time, he was seen as a, as a as a natural participant in global politics. I mean, he was not treated as a. Uh, you could see that in the te American diplomatic telegrams. There's none of that sort of contempt, you know, or sneering whatever, oh, it's just the UN, or how can we dupe the UN? But he was treated as a serious player in world politics, you know? So wow. I, I wonder if we need a new Hammerfell, a need, how are we going to solve this crisis with Russia? I mean, oh, you, can't, man. you can't win a war with Russia. Let's get that straight. It doesn't matter if you like Russia or not, but the point is, if you attack Russia, it's the end of the world. It's going to be the end of the world, nuclear war. So what do you, what, what, even most fervent neocons are gonna to have to understand that. And yeah. um, it's please more... rush that book out. I think you've just articulated the, the thesis of your Hammerskold book. And ironically, you'll be embraced by the Swedish establishment, I think, don't you? <laughs> don't you? Well, that's a funny thing, yeah. I mean, yeah. Uh, having immigration is much more contentious, <laughs> but this is, for a large swathe of Swedes, you know, Hammerfeld is uh, still God for them. And uh, yes. they find diplomatic entrees for me here. Excellent. But, you know, we're, you're talking about, since we're running out of time, I know you're a busy man. Yeah. Um, we're talking about the elephant in the room. I, I have to ask you about the, the elephant in the, in the living room. That's China. Are they uh, probing uh, the Baltic region, Sweden in specific? Are you seeing some kind of uh, China presence up your way? No. Uh, I can't... Uh... I can't comment on China at all. I mean, it's probably the region where, I mean, in, in as much as the China is active in Europe, it tends to be in the smaller countries in the Baltic and maybe Italy, because where their, their Belt and Road Initiative kind of terminates there at the moment. And uh, if you look at Sweden's, uh, the largest trading partners of, uh, of the world, each country in the world, it's, it's gone from the United States. There's this famous map where, where you can trace who your biggest tra trading partner is. And the map is... 2000 is entirely blue. That means nearly all countries had their biggest trade. The US was their biggest trading partner. And now it's almost entirely red, except for the UK, 
uh, Northern Europe, maybe maybe more of Western Europe, and then maybe some Latin American countries, the US and Canada. So that these are countries where US trade still holds its own, but in nearly the rest of the world, it's all China. And I think the Swedish make some, they, I mean, you can buy, there's a lot of um, business relationships between the Chinese and the Swedes. The Swedes don't have a visceral feeling about the Chinese. I mean, they probably quite respect them. I mean, because also this East Asian mentality, some people say it's like a, bit, a little bit like the Swedish mentality, which is it's non, it's non-confrontational basically. And some people say the Swedes are a bit like the Japanese and hardworking and so on. And, and, you know, Volvo, the Swedish car company was bought by the Chinese. And so was Saab actually, the other Swedish car company. Oh, wow. And then they're, make, they're making an electrical, they're making, based on the chassis from 2005 or whatever, they're still, they're churning out electric cars for the Chinese market, but they don't actually see the Swedish market at all. They're not, they're not even sold here and they're not advertised. So um, you can kind of go to China and see and, and see quite a lot of, um, uh, of these um, uh, Saabs from, you know, 2005, but absolutely new. And then I think the Swedes were quite vocal in their opposition to some uh, Chinese writer who uh, won the Nobel Prize and is being oppressed by China. But I don't think, I think that the, the, the Russia uh, issue, Russia problem is a much more uh, visceral one and acute for most Swedes. Mm -hmm. um, and I think, so th th there's, there's, a little, there's a little consciousness. I mean, you're in California and I guess you've got a Japanese background or something. Yes, I'm third generation Japanese right. American. Yeah. So, so you 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 must be you're focused and you're aware of that in a totally different way. Uh, whereas here, yeah, not much at all about. Um, there's no Pacific consciousness at all. I'd say. No, we have a, a Asia. This this is true for everybody. The man on the street. We have a, a more heavily Asia Pacific orientation and understanding geopolitically as well as culturally. And so far as demographics as well, I think San Francisco, uh, California is like 30% uh, Chinese ethnicity. And the reason I ask you this is because currently there's a great deal of Sinophobia in America, mostly uh, being put out there by the so-called alternative conservative media. And in doing so, they, again, ignore the, the dark hand of NATO and the Pentagon yeah, I, I, scapegoating I'm, China. Yeah, yeah. I'm sure. not a friend of Chinese communism or the the 80 right. million people that died in in order to build yeah. the communist uh, utopia. Oh. Don't get me wrong. I'm, I'm, I'm yeah, I'm quite pro. I'm I I'm relative compared to all my peers. I'm quite pro Chinese and pro Russian, and I read the China Global Times, and I think that everything. But what they, they, I had Russian friends who said, you know, we lived in, grew up in a communism. Everything they said about the Soviet economy was alive but everything they said about the west was true so i mean a lot of their their society a lot of the critique in the global times which is like the chinese equivalent of russia today is 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 accurate you know and then uh, i but then i can't speak i can't i can't um uh i have so little experience of, of china or internal russian politics for that matter i i can't really speak for either i don't speak russian what i usually say to people uh, who talk about Russia is that uh, it seems to me that Russia is relatively speaking freer than it's ever been uh, uh, by their measures and I think the West is less free than it's been and whether that reduction in freedom can be compared to the Russian increase in freedom and Russia is absolutely more free than than the West probably not you know I, I mean I, I wouldn't want to live in, in Russia you know I'm quite happy to live in in this in this society but um, I think that the Russians have to be given their due and they have to be it has to be a fair argument and it has to be listened to and i think the russians have done some fantastic things in, in their history and they've come a very long way in a short time as have the chinese so i i, I don't want to pre and i since i generally believe disbelieve anything that comes out of the new york times or whatever uh, or uh, anything that comes out of the american media you know um I just switch off when they say that, and I, I, with, I withdraw, I withhold any kind of opinion about it. Um, and I, I'm vaguely, I'm sort of favorably disposed to, to these countries, basically. Um, well, excellent. Um, we're depending on uh, people like myself, we're depending on 
independent minds like yourself, independent citizen journalists, people that have that professional background and experience as yourself, the cosmopolitan outlook, to really help us uh, circumvent the uh, propaganda mills of uh, New York City, right? The or Washington D.C., the the Washington um, Post, right? You, you know all about it. Yeah. So I encourage you to um, keep plugging away at these books. What's your next one in in the pipeline? Well, I thought maybe doing something about how much wrote because we're doing the film. Oh, okay. <laughs> so, so it'll be a quick book based on research I'm doing for the film. But I mean, I think yeah, we're on the same page. I think that the American um, people who used to respect America, if they knew what the lies of Washington Post and New York Times and the warmongering that they do, I mean, it's, it's just shocking, really. I mean, it's all to, be, to, to advocate nuclear war or to be a crime against humanity. Like they ought to be sent to Nuremberg, the modern version of Nuremberg. I mean, wh what is it with American media? If you, you can't call, if you say it's a colored person rather than a person of color, you can use your job. But if you say, hey, we've got to have a nuclear war, you get the promotion. That's insane, you know? No. So uh, the fish rots from the head. What's wrong? Those of us who love aspects of America, what's wrong with your media? Why is it so full of lies and hatred, you know? <laughs> mm -hmm. Well, the uh, Pentagon's job is, is hatred, destruction, and blowing up big uh, structures. And these are arms of the Pentagon. And uh, as you probably realize, the Pentagon is fused with NATO. So I refer to that as the NATO caliphate. Yeah. You NATO. Well, UN NATO well, caliphate. Global caliphate. Well, what it is, it, it's, I mean, it, it's America using the extortionate privilege of the dollar to build up its military machine. And basically, you've got a bureaucracy that needs things to do, wars to pr prosecute, sitting in Washington. And... Um, it needs to be dismantled, otherwise we can end up with the end of the world, you know. Uh, and it's it's um, it's a self-serving, closed, um, I don't know, what's the word, closed echo chamber of opinions, which just reinforce each other, you know, and I think well, it's really dangerous. There was a Pentagon paper written not long ago, they refer to it as the self-licking ice cream cone. Oh, okay. <laughs> I'll send a copy to you. Mr. Taylor, it's been an yeah. incredible conversation. Okay. Please consider me one of your West Coast California allies and sources from Great. here well, on we'll, out. We'll stay in touch, you know. We can send Please. each other ideas and so on. And, uh, thank you so much, Mr. Taylor. Okay, well, thank you. I'm going to end the recording right now and say goodbye to you after we okay. end. Thank, thank you. you. Thank Bye, you. ladies and gentlemen. I hope you enjoyed the show. I certainly did.